Hallelujah. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Andre. Who doesn't know me? I'm Andre. And um, when I was presented with an opportunity to preach and choose the topic, obviously my line of thought was that the shoemaker should first teach about how to make shoes. <laughs> so I chose the topic which I have some qualifications in by virtue of facts uh, about worship, praise, and music and how these things uh, operate in the kingdom of God and how we should learn this wonderful skill. Why do we need to learn it? Because obviously the Father seeks the, the worshipers in the spirit and truth. So we all are called to this high calling to be the lovers of God, to be the lovers of God and uh, freely choose Him. May I have the presentation, please? And by the way, before we start, so one act of praise and worship is more wonderful and powerful than 10,000 words said about that. Let's just do it. One of the forms we can do, we can thank God, right? So many of you have languages other than, your, other than English, let's say. So if we just say all together on one, two, three, thank you God for, for Jesus or for Yeshua in your own native language, that would be a great act of worship. Let's do that in your own language, yeah? One, two, three. Спасибо за Иисуса! Hey, тода, тода, донай. Тода летора, лейшуа. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. That's wonderful. And um, we can recall the words of King David. If I go up to, heavens, to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. In my view, this represents the journey of the soul as we seek the Lord. Our soul sometimes goes up to the heaven. We're happy. We seek the Lord, and He is there. Sometimes we feel like we're making our bed in the depths, meaning nearly dying or to the depths of the valleys, and God is still there. So these are the two places where we are most prominently and specially meet God, meet, meet God at our highs and at our lows. That's why God says, Yeshua says, don't be lukewarm. Either be hot or be cold. There's the best chances for you to meet me there. If you're somewhere in the middle, you... You, you're probably the, mo the remotest of me. That's the chart. That's, that's the plan. So that's the David's pattern. And we may keep that in mind as we go through the presentation. So praise, I see, is a scent of our soul to God, where we express, where we exercise pressure of our soul, where, where we admonish our soul to lift up. Oh, my soul, David says. Praise God. So we need to exercise this effort, effort on ourselves to express ourselves, to go outside of ourselves Outward to God, up to God. That's the idea, that's the movement. So language may be, you know, a little bit shaky in terms of English as to how it represents, but that's the movement of our soul, up and outward to God. And worship is an opposing movement where we press inwards toward to seek God in our depths when, when we descend to God. So these are the two movements, up and out with pressure, and inwards and down also with pressure to meet God. And music has been made by God as an instrument, as the aid for both of these movements. It facilitates movements of our soul to what God's when we ascend to Him or when we descend to Him. If it makes sense? That's great. So these are the key principles and we'll just disclose them a little bit further. So let's just come to the time when the Lord created the universe. Could you imagine him creating it with the, with the music, let's say? Why this wouldn't be an aid to his soul as part of his great wisdom? And of wisdom, the Solomon writes in Proverbs, Then I was beside him like a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always. God definitely enjoyed the act of creation. And we may even imagine that, that uh, all the artisan skills he invested in his creation were also accompanied by equal joy and equal crafty state of his soul. So we may find music somewhere in there. While it's not explicitly written, I assume that is a great joy of God was accompanied by that. Or we can imagine that. 
And the music is an instrument. Uh, let's just talk about that first before we go into praise and worship it's themselves as movements of our soul. What is this aid? We can find the history of this aid to our soul um, through the Bible. And at the time when uh, Tabernacle of Moshe was up and service was there, uh, we don't find music yet used in the ceremonial and rites of worship and praise. But what we find is that the music was used as part of prophetic ministry. We may remember when Saul was met by the, by the multitudes and schools of prophets descending from the hills, and they were playing instruments, they were um, worshiping and praising the Lord. And one of the ministry of prophets was to memorize the word of God, and obviously using rhythms, rhymes, and music tunes was one of the aids how to memorize the word of the Lord. They, they were basically learning and singing the word, and uh, we find that part in later when David set up his tabernacle. He reformed the tabernacle. He reformed that uh, where he brought in Levites and musicians right into the holy ark, and uh, they were singing songs before the Lord, and uh, his personal gratitude and presence were aided greatly um, with this style of worship and praise at David's tabernacle, where it was close and personal. And at the Temple of Solomon, all that development of musical ministry uh, was highly embraced by the nation of Israel, and um, uh, Levites, Levites were accompanying the Kohanic uh, service or, or priestly services with uh, praise, music, with singing, and the community of Israel was singing it along uh, with Levites as the sacrifices were made in the temple. And that greatly advanced the culture of music among Israel. David obviously was the reformer. He brought in this bridge from personal to community. And it became a heritage of Israel and now our heritage as well. So now we can all enjoy uh, the songs of psalms and other hymns. Uh, and that tradition is well established as the aid for our worship and praise. So while these aids are there, we can recall now that now in the era of Messiah when Yeshua came, uh, we as faithful can use music for all these uh, traits, for our personal gratitudes and availing his, pers his presence uh, to aid our prophetic gifts and releases of the of gifts of the Spirit in our community and also our communal manifestation as we all are gathering together and worship our God and praise him. We all use music for that. And these are the great things. Now coming to the essence of praise and worship. So while we can do these movements of up towards God or down towards God, we can do that individually or together. Uh, there is some history, biblical history, how that develops. And in the term praise uh, comes from uh, old Egyptian language where the relative letters were also devised. And they show a man with hands raised up. That's the jubilation. That's the celebration. Uh, that's the attitude and the movement, of, and the movement shown clearly in, in pictographs. We're going up. We're going up to God. We celebrate our soul and our body lifts up. Uh, so the word halel comes from that ancient uh, roots of Egyptian language, a triumphant shouting, rejoicing exaltation, a shouting for joy. Amen? Amen. Interestingly enough, this, what you see on the screen, is the most ancient form of God's holy sac sacred name, found on the lead tablets, small tablets found at the Mount Ebal, where Joshua uh, was uh, setting up the... the Alta and uh, proclaiming curses from that particular mountain. So you could see the, the middle letter is the letter He, the most ancient letter He, in the whole, written in the holy name of God. And that's the, the, that's the most ancient depiction of this letter in the holy name. And you see, phrase, phrase of God. So, that's, so remember that. Every time you do praise, don't be shy to lift your hands to God. 
Worship with your soul, with your body. Admonish yourself. Put the pressure on yourself to actually express yourself to God. Uh, there's many biblical words used throughout uh, how to express that outward and upward movement of our soul with this pressure. Tehila, with praise, adoration, glory, and splendor. Zemer, singing songs, uh, using string instrument. Yada, to revere, to praise with raised hands. So Yada is interesting. Yad, yad is the hand. So lift your hands. Toda, gratitude, thankfulness. Berak, to kneel, to bow, to bless. So it's not a strict rule that our soul always moves up or always moves down. We can tremble before the Lord, by the way. Up and down, tremble. So it's, it's a converging movement. We just need to somehow differentiate between these two. Shiva, praise, glory, or increase in value. And one of the Psalms of David uses, let's say, four different terms at the same time in one breath. Enter his gates with the gift of thanks, Toda. His courts with songs of praise, Tehila. Raise your hands in thanksgiving, Yada, to him. Humbly kneel before his name, or bend your knees. That's for the praise, the movement up and outward with pressure exercised on ourselves and our souls. Now with the worship, uh, it's a strange word with, of old, which means um, describing the state of or condition of being worthy, of someone being worthy. And also that involves the process of us becoming worthy of him. We need to remember that praise and worship is a two-way road. It's never one-way road. It's not about us, us as I. It's about us as we, with God. It's a dialogue. It's a partnership, it's a love, it's a mutual expression of love. And we can check uh, the biblical words which were used for this homage as inward and downward pressure. Uh, we can remember that this is a roadway downhill, somewhat. For example, Nishkubar, or kiss the chosen one, lest he be angry and, he, we per and uh, you perish in the way when the wrath is kindled by the little, blessed are all who take refuge in him. This is Psalm 2, the most quoted psalm in the New Testament. It's quoted four times. And uh, the Greek words used around with the same notion is to kiss toward somebody, to prostrate in homage, to do reverence, to adore, stooping to kiss the earth. It's very important to understand that this is a movement down. Down so far and so much that there's no more us and just him. Some other biblical words using and conveying the same meaning of inward and downward pressure where we humble ourselves, where we press ourselves to reduce our presence and increase his presence in us. To bend the knees so we think that we strongly stand on both feet and suddenly we bend our knees and we feel feeble. And that's the notion which is given to us that there's no strength in ourselves. The only strength is in the Lord which we seek. And we come to the point where we test our weakness to the most. And sometimes that happens as we dialogue with God and God helps us to walk in this road uh, to do his purposes. Some words in Greek is kampto, to bend, bow, the knee. Shachach. Uh, to depress by implication to prostrate, bow down, fall down, flat, humbly beseech, do obeisance. Some good word I have been suggested is a base. When we find our base, basically, we lower ourselves so far that we come to the edge of ourselves down. To prostrate, to fall down, hava. This is a unique word which has unique grammatic structure in the whole biblical uh, language. It's a unique binyan, which is used only with this word, hava. Um, this word is met in the Bible for the first time in Akidah, in uh, Genesis 22, when Abraham brings Isaac. He says, we will go and worship the Lord. And this word is uniquely used in unique uh, grammatical form throughout the Bible. However, it's not uniquely used to 
pay homage to God, as you can see the inscription, inscription chronicles that also could be done to the king. However, that is definitely the, one of the unique and specific words used in the Bible for worship. To prostrate, fall down, sagad. There's many words. Watch that, how many facets of this is rendered in the Bible. Yare, to fear, to be afraid, to stand in awe, in reverence, and honor and respect before God. Those of you who have fear, who have fear of the Lord, that's one of the address to us as we worship him. Abed or Abad, to serve, work, perform acts of worship. By the way, while you're worshiping the Lord with your finances, with your tithes and offering, remember that by doing this, you worship the Lord. That because you're working for this money, hence any time of the moment you're working and you're earning all these dollars and which then later you give for good works of God, you do Worship. So praise and worship uh, can be looked at together, how these two movements up and down work for our souls. Uh, one of the great examples is words of uh, John the Mercer about Yeshua. He must become greater and I must become less. That's a downward movement of worship. One of the formulas how we can exercise worship when we reduce and God increases in our midst. Obviously that takes pressure when we need to suppress, humble ourselves. There will be less of me and more of you. And to the point when, when Rabbi Shaul writes in Galatians, I have been crucified with Messiah and I no longer live but Messiah lives in me. That's the peak or the depth rather. Depth of worship. Peaks of praise, depth of worship. So that's the depth of worship. We all are called to reach these depths with God, these highs with God. Let's watch that space. And as we describe this further, praise, and let's just oppose praise and worship as two movements and compare how this could be interpreted in the kingdom language. Praise is the upward pressure of our ascent to God, towards the increase of God's presence when we can feel him abundantly, when we can immerse our souls into his special feelings, special presence, special manifestations. Worship is a downward pressure of descent to God towards decree, decrease of ourselves to naught. That could be the time when we feel nothing, when we feel depressed, when we are in desperation. And that is the most likely place where we can meet God. So we must be open at that point and never lose that from our sight. Praise is due to a sovereign king who is independent of his creation. We owe him everything. We can never cry loud enough to actually uh, be, to, to, to bring it worthily. So he is independent of us. But worship is opposing thought. We're dependent on him. Worship is due to our intimate father who created us in his image as his dependence. So these are just descriptions of up and down movements, as you can see, uh, with thoughts aligned with that uh, template. We praise God outwardly, outwardly, expressedly, as we speak to the utmost high God. And sometimes and very often we worship him quietly at the end of ourselves as he speaks and we want to hear his words in our inner sanctuary. We, all together, individually and collectively, we are his praise as our names are inscribed on his pierced palms when we realize ourselves in Messiah. We realize ourselves in Messiah. Hence, we go out in the world and we bring him praise as everybody sees our good deeds and they praise our Father. So we are his praise. All the talents, all the uh, good success we have in this world and people know that we carry his name, we are his praise outwardly in the world. We expressedly on the hill, beaming light, as we realize ourselves in Messiah and gain the success in this world as well. And he is the focus of our, of our worship as we impress and engrave his word and image in our softened hearts when we realize Messiah in us. So this is inward pressure. When we take the template of the holy word of God, take it in onto our hearts. We press it hard. We learn by heart the holy words. We 
render his image in our softened heart. That is the act of worship. Praise is our experience of ascent and abiding by the right hand of God. We are brought to him. We must remember we can never do praise and worship in our own strength. We just can't interact with supernatural being as God in our own strength or our own understanding. That is a supernatural act in which God has a great role to play. And we are brought to him. There we praise him. Worship is our experience of his descent and in dwelling in us as a Holy Spirit, where with His image is born again in us. We're born again into His image. So He enables us to worship Him as He did this descent first to us. So we admire His descent to us, and we realize that in ourselves. So we descend. So when we humble ourselves to serve the needy, the poor, when we serve our children, the feeble in the community, we descend to them from our glory. We take our clothes, we gird our lines, and we wash the feet as Yeshua did. And we all w watch the Lord, how he did that. He left the glory of heaven. So that was his act of worship to the Father. Isn't it? Is we praise, we express ourselves and lift up and meet our God at his throne. In worship, we depress ourselves down, suppress our wants, our need, our ego, our um, whatever we think of ourselves. We depress it down to meet him at the cross. That's the ultimate lowest point, how far Yeshua came down to the depth of death. And there is a reason for all that pressure which we apply inwardly. We, more and more, render his image in us. So these acts of praise and worship have this beautiful meaning of rendering his image in us, molding us, and preserving and strengthening that image in us. Praise is an admission of his purpose, that is to celebrate God's image. So we admit that God had done great things, he did his wonderful works in us, we're his praise, and he celebrates God's image in us, with us. Worship is a submission to a purpose, to God's purpose. It is to render God's image. It's all linked together and converging, as you can see, on having God's image in us. So praise and worship, while they're aided by the musical gifts and instruments, all of that should lead us into a lifestyle of God's lovers, intimate worshipers in the spirit and truth, where he has all the freedom and strength to render his image in us. As as Paul writes, and just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. That's the purposes of all this cycle and movements of our souls as we travel with God. And we can see the image of this cycle of uh, praise and worship in, in how once Jeremiah was invited to the potter's house and he has been given an image of how God deals with Israel and he deals with all of us like that. Uh, Arise and go down to the potter's house and there I will cause you to hear my word. Interestingly enough, there's two movements described here. Arise and go down. Interesting, isn't it? So that gives me a hint that this has a pattern of praise and worship in it, invitation to that cycle of work where God wants to render his image in us. And as we know, as he sovereignly works with us through this, uh, he is the master. We are the clay. And we cannot say anything to him. He works with us as he pleases. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred and his hands, so the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best for him. A rising and descent to a potter's house is a type of a praise and worship where we invited into this work of God. And we need to remember that as we project that or extrapolate that image on us, how God works with us, 
Sometimes we could be deformed by breaking and reworking to rid of impurities and oddities in us. And that's definitely painful. And that's definitely where we need to press our souls and exercise that conscious worship on our road down as we go to meet God. That can be done, obviously. We can, we can talk about that in details. We also, after we are deformed, if we need to be deformed, we are formed by shaping and molding and fashioning to render the shape of his choice. We should never envy of others, oh, she's so beautiful, or he's so talented. You never know. If you surrender yourself to God, he works miracles, mysteries, through your soul, through your personality. You never know how much you're worth in this world and in his kingdom. You may think you're unworthy or whatever you may think of yourself. It means nothing. God cares for who you are and he molds you as long as you let him do this. And once you take the shape God wants, he hardens you by fire to resist the pressures of views and keep the shape as you, as you further go into the world to praise him and show the shape and exercise the shape God gained in you. And interestingly enough, I don't walk too far, but you have ears to hear. You watch the clay is immersed in water, obviously to be deformed or to be broken, and to, right, to be softened. Clay is immersed in idea or the mind of God, how the shape should look like. And clay is immersed in fire to keep that shape. Interesting. And when we suffer pains, let's just go through these uh, three aspects uh, which accompany praise and worship cycle. When we suffer pains for God's sake, we worship him by deforming into his image. Wasn't his face deformed beyond any man? Wasn't it his act of worship to his father? Hard to comprehend. Hard to comprehend. How should we give ourselves to God? And when we think, Oh, God, I need to change that much so far. It will be not me anymore. I will recognize myself. Yes. You are not yet who I want to be. And we can see that by circumcision or death of our flesh. Flesh is the part of soul which is not yet submitted fully to God. So that part of our soul must die or be circumcised and thrown away from us, or be dead. When we experience in this world prosecution for truth, when God may exercise these pressures on us uh, for his glory, for his working with us, his mysterious ways, when we never seek this or want this, but he wants, and we surrender. Or experiencing spiritual poverty, when we realize that we are nothing without him, that we are yet nobody, and if we ever be someone. So that's the hard part, when we have been deformed and cleaned of purities and oddities. And then, as we are soft, and we are not breaking the cycle of God by hardening in the wrong shape, because if we do harden out of the God's shape, what's gonna happen? Sometimes that vessel may be broken without repair. And that is the dangerous place. If we take our shape my way, God, my shape, God, I take it hard. You have nothing in me. Such vessels may be broken suddenly without repair. So be watchful not to harden your uh, shape, your heart, outside of God's cycle of deforming, forming, and hardening. In time, he does that. So when we are formed by him, we're transformed by the renewing of our mind as we learn his word by heart as we eat it abundantly, this milk, this meat, and we grow and uh, our inner man feeds on God. When we are meek and humble to his character, that is great. That's the right shape. We're seeking peace, truth, and mercy with all our relationship. That's the right shaping. And once he achieved this, we need to remember that like Jeremiah has been asked to be flexible by not marrying, by not starting a family, which is natural and it was very painful to be flexible with that request of God. 
At the same time, God said, yes, you're flexible in that area which I've asked you to flex. But I will make your faces flint against them, and you will be strong and hard against them. You, you will be diamond-shaped against them. You'll never... Um, so we must be, keep and be flexible towards God and hard against the world and the sin. So this balance we need to be achieved. And as God hardens us, or at least tells us explicitly, that's the shape I want you to be. We must firm, stand firmly and keep it dearly and stand for the truths which we have gained and never give it up and never change our shape or opinion if we have received that from God. That's very important. Because if you know that you have achieved God's revelation or God's truth in certain area of life and certain truth, stand by it because God will test, he may test you how hard you are, or the world will obviously test you. Are you really strong in your faith? He will test. Keeping faith and purity of heart, that's how we sh keep the shape given to us. Staying uninfluenced by ungodly opinions or wants which attack from, from the flesh, from our past, from our memories, from our old ways. Let's be uninfluenced by our wrong past. When we persevere the hardships, we exercise long suffering as we live in this world in these last days. We must keep what is right. We must keep the, words God, the word of God high and strong and undamaged and uncompromised. It's hard, it's difficult, but that's, that's the praise which we show to God in this world. And once Yeshua was tested by Pharisees, he basically said, render to the Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. And there's a many interpretations which exist on this parable and this situation. It obviously muted the Pharisees. But what I see in this parable is exactly this uh, work of God, which we've just spoken about as a summary. So Yeshua was pressed on the topic uh, of taxes, and he conformed his listeners to the truth by preaching over a Roman coin. So he took the denarius, and he asks, whose are these scripts and images of Caesar? And he says, surrender to the Caesar things that are of Caesar, and unto God the things that are God's. So what are the things of God? Is it the temple tax? Well, obviously these coins of Caesar were exchanged for temple coins. There were t coin changes, right, in the temple. Because these, these were mundane, unholy coins. You cannot even give them to God. So obviously this coin would never be actually a true donation to the God's uh, sanctuary. Interesting. So what he means? And we can render that the scripts and the image depressed by the Caesar, they do belong and return to Caesar. But the word of the life spoken by God into the man whom he made in his image, those life scripts and images, they return to God. We are God's text. His kingdom, his Israel, his New Testament believers, they're the text God takes from this world. And we are his. Israel was once a special nation which clearly bore the name of God on them. And they still do. And they will ever do so. Because God does not take his imprints off. He just re now t takes p all people from all the nations to join his image and script. We owe to God the image he intended for us to be. We are his text. And this is the truth we need to obey. And we need to remember that Yeshua is our temple of praise and our template for worship. As we assess these upward movements of our souls in praise and in this world with outward pressure which flow from us to praise God. And when we come to the template of worship by descending to God and finding Him you know, in the self and uh, letting him to deform, form, and harden us to do his purposes and his wills. May we all give God praise again? Yeah? Now freely do so in your language as well. 30 seconds. Just raise your voice, raise your hands, and in your own language, just 
Say to God whatever you want to thank Him for, whatever you want to praise. One, two, three. Спасибо, Господь. Мы любим Тебя. Тебе вся слава. Пусть Твое имя и Твое царство будут благословенны во веки. Мы Тебя любим, чтим Тебя, поклоняемся Тебе. Пусть всякий мир будет. Шалом, шалом, шалом. Туда. Амин. Мир. Спасибо.